Okay, everyone, welcome to topic 7.2, imperialism from imperialism debates. If you guys want a good laugh at uh, my own expense, I am now recording from my basement because I decided to stay after school to try and record a couple of these videos and the fire alarm went off. So um, that was super fun and I did not feel like sticking around. So now I'm here. Um, also, because my husband says I have a loud New Jersey voice, I have to record this in the basement because I distract him from his work with my loud New Jersey voice. But anyhow, um, our learning objective for imperialism debates is going to be explain the similarities and differences in attitudes about the nation's proper role in the world. So this is kind of like an intro really to 7.3, which is going to be kind of long, which I've already discussed with you guys. I'm going to try and keep that short as best I can. Okay. Um, so the big question to start you off for this topic, and that shows up in your intro box, how did U.S. foreign policy change after the Civil War? How did it change after 1890? So, okay, where we're going to kind of start off here is after the Civil War. So with a booming industrial economy, that's really where um, we're going to be following that war, right? That's like the rise of the Gilded Age, laissez-faire capitalism. We see urbanization, growth of industry. And with a booming dust industrial economy, excuse me, the U.S. is going to show increase, increasing interest in overseas trade and in establishing bases and territories in the Caribbean and across the Pacific. So we want to go further, right? Like we think of Frederick Jackson Turner's like thesis and the safety valve theory. We need to find other lands and other places for economic reasons, um, now for military reasons, okay? Um, the idea of manifest destiny, stuff like that, all right? After 1890, so even further, so now if we're entering this like period seven period, the nation is going to carry on a growing debate over whether it should join the competition for overseas territories with imperialist nations of the world to remain true to its, or excuse me, to remain true to its anti-colonial tradition. So do we go and imperialize other nations and kind of keep up with that game and try and stay in the forefront of um, foreign power? Or should we remember where we came from? Should we remember that we once had a revolution um, because we were a colony ourselves and we wanted to have self-government, self-determination, and all of those principles that we hear, um, hold very closely to our own ideals as a nation. That's the idea. So what we're going to see next, okay, is going to be expansion after the Civil War. So this does take us back a little bit, all right? William H. Seward of New York, he actually is going to be the most influential Secretary of State since John Quincy Adams. And I would like to remind you guys I very briefly mentioned this at the time. C word is actually the Secretary of State under Abraham Lincoln. Okay, so we're really kind of rewinding back to like the 1860s here for a second um, and doing one of those flashback type things that I know we love so much. So C word during the Lincoln administration, he does have a lot of successes. Okay, and even in his time following Lincoln and stuff like that. He is going to prevent Britain and France from aiding the Confederacy during the Civil War. He's going to annex Midway Island in the Pacific and bring that under United States control. He's going to gain rights to build a canal in Nicaragua. And he, too, is going to purchase Alaska. So he is very successful as an expansionist in terms of a secretary of state. OK, some of his failures or his shortcomings, he couldn't convince Congress to necessarily annex Hawaii or to purchase the Danish West Indies. So he is very proactive about trying to add to our empire. Congress is gonna have some more anti-imperialist elements at this time, um, or they're just not gonna be super keen on these things. In terms of the purchase of Alaska, Russia and Great Britain, they did both claim Alaska as a territory. They had like a joint occupation of it. Russia eventually took over. And after a while, they were just looking to sell it and get rid of it. C word as more of an expansionist, he lobbied for it in front of Congress and Congress did decide to buy it for $7.2 million. And Alaska is massive. Okay. It's like the size of half of the continental United States. So that's a ton of land. It's just very cold up there. Right. Um, and Congress really makes fun of C word for quite some time about this. Whenever they refer to Alaska or the land in general, they very frequently call it Seward's Folly or Seward's Icebox because they just didn't find Alaska particularly useful at the time. Um, however, you know, he gets a pretty massive land purchase from this deal and it adds to the empire, right? So Americans had been settling in Hawaii, kind of on another note, right? 
since the mid 1800s and eventually Ulysses S. Grant sought control of Pearl Harbor and new trade treaties with the native kingdom, okay? Hawaiians agreed to this treaty and they gave the U.S. exclusive rights to trade their sugar. So there's kind of like this partnership deal. Um, Hawaiian sugar becomes very lucrative very quickly. Americans are going there to extract the sugar. They're going to be trading it and it's making them money, right? So we know that the U.S. is going to continually be interest in this, interested in this area. In 1893, American settlers are going to aid the overthrow of Queen Lily Lukalani, and she is going to petition for annexation, or sorry, the Americans are going to petition for annexation. So they completely overthrow the Queen of Hawaii, um, and this is done for American economic gain, right? Like they're explicitly doing this to hopefully bring Hawaii into the United States, okay? And one of the reasons for that was that if Hawaii were annexed, its sugar would not be subjected any longer to the high um, U.S. tariffs on imports, right? Because if Hawaii is not considered a part of the United States, and there are high protective tariffs in place, and that sugar is going to be taxed if it comes into the United States, and people in the U.S. aren't going to want to buy it compared to maybe sugar they're getting from elsewhere, okay? If Hawaii becomes a part of the United States, that sugar is no longer, longer going to be subjected to those tariffs or those taxes, and therefore it's going to be more friendly for the people or the Americans who are capitalizing on that sugar there. Um, President Cleveland, who's a Democrat, he is going to block the annexation of Hawaii as he opposed imperialism. So again, I just want to point out, I'm not trying to confuse you guys, that we're talking about Cleveland here. These are still, this is overlapping with the Gilded Age a little bit. I just want you to know that this is still going to be a time when the U.S. is very like business friendly, okay? Cleveland as a Democrat is a little bit different than some of the Republicans that we saw throughout the Gilded Age. And um, he does kind of block this measure. Okay, so again, we're kind of in flashback mode stuff. With this era of new imperialism, the United States and how it's going to get involved. So the conquest of Africa, Asia, and the Pacific Islands by industrialized nations is going to spark a renewed interest in imperialism, and the U.S. will participate in this contest, okay? So if you think back to your world history course, I'm sure you talked about imperialism and world history to a great, great extent. Um, this is where U.S. kind of meeting world history a little bit, all right? All of these European nations, they are starting to imperialize in Africa, Asia, and we, as a younger nation that does want to start having a lot of conversations on the world stage, especially with our growing economic power, we want to make sure that we're in this mix, we are getting the benefits from this, and we have a seat at the table, okay? So most U.S. advocates of expansionism are going to want to expand through economic and diplomatic means over the use of military action, though, okay? We want to help our economy. We want to engage in diplomacy. Um, we really do not want to be engaging still, for the most part, at least right now, in foreign wars if we don't need to, right? And that's just kind of a good rule of thumb. In terms of economic interests, United States business um, supported imperialism due to the raw materials that would be available, right? Like mineral, oil, rubber, um, those things can be extracted from other places in the world, but aren't necessarily available in abundance in the United States. Republican politicians, especially, they're going to closely ally with business leaders, and they're going to endorse imperialistic initiatives. Okay, they're going to be very pro-imperialism, where Democrats or even like, um, really Democrats might be a little bit more reserved about that. Farmers Actually, two, you might not think of them in this group. A lot of farmers are going to be pretty eager to sell to some of these overseas markets as well, and the growing populations there. So farmers were actually pretty pro-imperialism because um, they could sell, like let's say you were a cotton farmer and we imperialize a place that doesn't really have cotton or have means to acquire it, that would be a new market for their particular crop to go to and sell at. So farmers would support imperialism as well which might sound like an odd thing. In terms of politics, military power, and um, just social fears in general, um, so some people are going to believe that the United States needed to compete with other imperialist countries, so they weren't sidelined in world affairs. And that is a good point, right? Like if we don't play this game of carving up the world in terms of economic and political and military interests, we're gonna get left out and we're gonna get forgotten about in terms of world affairs. 
So Alfred T. Mahan, he is going to be a U.S. Navy captain, and he believes and he actually shapes the debate over the need for U.S. naval bases in the influence of sea power upon history. So within this book, he argues that a strong Navy is crucial in securing foreign markets and becoming a world power. Um, Congress is going to allow the construction of steel ships and the acquisition of overseas islands. And later, actually, in the next topic, Teddy Roosevelt and Senator Henry Cabot Lodge are going to push this agenda even further. OK, so this becomes Mahan's theory has become popular very, very quickly. There are some social fears. OK, the Panic of 1893, violence of labor conflicts and the perception that the country is losing its frontier, like we saw in Frederick Jackson Turner's thesis. That's going to push the United States to acquire more territory as a new safety valve. So, again, in period six, you know, we mentioned frontier is closed, right? Like we pretty much discovered and charted the entire Western United States. Um, and we used to always use that as our safety valve or our safety net. If times were tough for American citizens, they could always move West, to try and acquire land and create a better life for themselves. And so now that's slowly running out. And so many Americans are pro-imperialist because they believe we need to acquire new land, new territory, um, new economic resources to act as our new safety valve. Okay, so a couple of other familiar topics that transcend into this period, we have Darwinism, religion, and popular press. Some see U.S. imperialism as an extent, extension of the manifest destiny, right, to like spread American culture throughout, like not just the continent now, but the world, and um, spread American ideals too. They're also going to apply Darwin's concept of survival of the fittest to competition in not only business, like we saw in the Gilded Age, that like the strongest businesses without intervention will um, thrive and survive. But we're also going to take Darwinism and um, apply it to competition in and among other countries as well. OK, that like certain nations are superior and therefore they can take over and dominate and even to a degree exploit other nations as a result, or they have a duty or a privilege to um, like civilize nations that might not have access to like their ways of life. So I don't know if you guys remember Rudyard Kipling and like the whole white man's burden poem from world history, but that's kind of what I'm getting at here. Okay. Um, expansionists, and they're going to want to acquire territory overseas. For example, Josiah, Josiah Strong is going to mention in our country that Anglo-Saxon people were, quote unquote, the fittest to survive and had a religious duty to spread Christianity and the benefits of their superior civilization to the less fortunate. Note the air quotes there. Um, to support these missionaries. Oh, many Americans wanted Congress to be active in foreign affairs. OK. Um, popular press, newspapers, and magazine editors, they're going to increase circulation by printing adventure stories about distant places and far off lands, and they kind of glaramize or like um, eroticize like these foreign places that the United States is interested in acquiring or having economic influence or political influence in, okay? So these eventually are going to create greater demands for a larger U.S. role in foreign affairs from the general public as well. Opposition to imperialism, this does exist, okay? Um, there are Americans that oppose American imperialism because they believe in self-determination. That same idea that, again, we were initially a colony that broke away from a mother country because we wanted to have our own determination in our fate and in our government um, and in our way of life, right? And so there seems to be something inherently wrong about a nation like the United States trying to exert its power over others and tell them what to do, right? And how to be governed and um, what is best for them. So a lot of Americans do reject imperialist um, racial theories like white superiority and social Darwinism, but they also fear adding non-whites to the U.S. population. We do still have a very high nativist sentiment in the United States at this time. They're going to support ideas of isolationism, as George Washington recommended, that we should really try and stay out of foreign affairs whenever possible, and that does apply to imperialism as well. And they're going to expose the... Um, and, okay, yeah, so basically 
Oh, the expense. Okay, yeah, they're going to expose the expense of imperialism, meaning how expensive it is, okay? That it's going to cost money to make all these naval bases and travel throughout the world and exert our power over these other places and have political influence over these other places. Um, and yeah, so they really are just kind of concerned about the cost and the dollar value all of, of all of this in the end, too. Because so, there we go, navies and foreign control, they're both expensive. All right, so Latin America, really quickly, the United States is going to assume a role in Latin America because it is in the Western Hemisphere, okay? The whole idea of the Monroe Doctrine is finally coming back now. So um, James G. Blaine of the Harrison administration, the Benjamin Harrison administration towards the end of the Gilded Age, um, there he's going to, Blaine is going to play a principal role in this idea. Um, the Pan American diplomacy. So the Pan American conference, meaning like all of the Americas, like North, Central, and South, um, they're going to have representatives from various nations of the Western Hemisphere. Okay, meaning North, Central, South America. They decided to create a permanent organization to promote cooperation of trade in addition to other issues. It wasn't amazing. It didn't work out as great as they wanted it to. But the Pan American Union is um, really kind of continued today in a different form called the Organization of American States. Okay, so it is something and an idea that did transcend into the future. Cleveland, Olney, and the Monroe Doctrine. So President Cleveland and Secretary of State Olney, they insist that Great Britain agree to arbitrate at this time, a boundary dispute between Venezuela and Guyana, which is a British colony. Um, the British said that the United States should not be involved. They're like, why do you guys care? about this border dispute. This has to do with one of our colonies and not yours. Um, however, the United States decides to cite the Monroe Doctrine, okay? So if you guys remember the Monroe Doctrine way back, okay, from like period four, right, with Secretary of State Monroe, it basically said that nations in the Western Hemisphere, meaning the Americas, North, Central, and South America, will kind of have control over and stay in the Western Hemisphere. And that people in the Eastern Hemisphere, like Europe, shouldn't get involved, okay? Like, U.S. will handle Western Hemisphere, you guys can handle your side of the world. And so now we're bringing this back up in, like, the late 1800s, early 1900s, which I know sounds a little nuts, but um, they cite the Monroe Doctrine, and they say that, like, we do have the right to get involved as the United States because it's in our neighborhood. And the, the United States does threaten military action if the British do not comply. OK, um, the British eventually decide to comply because they do want to save their friendship with the United States. And we actually will find that British American relations and um, allyship is going to prove quite handy in the 1900s, for sure, especially with conflicts that have yet to come. OK. You guys are going to go ahead, read through topic 7.3. You're going to come back, and this is going to be the big one. Um, and I have a couple of caveats for you when you come back here to watch this video as well.